During our uh, recent uh, memorial service, remember this? Where we honored those who passed away in the last two year period. I was reminded of many past events that took place here at Choctaw. Every face you know, tells a story. Uh, uh, each of us in one way or another had some interaction with all of the individuals whose pictures are are here and uh, that, we, that we remembered on that memorial Sunday. I, I remember that Sunday to be a, a marvelous uh, worship experience. And I still remember the, the great job that uh, Marty did when he uh, kind of eulogized each of these individuals in two or three sentences. It was very, very effective. Well, in seeing uh, Dave Roberts, seeing his face reminded me of the 18 months we spent remodeling this building back in uh, 97, 90, 1997, 1998. It was quite a job, a lot of people involved uh, in that remodel. And I remember taking encouragement uh, for that long and difficult project by reading about a similar task that the Jews undertook in the building of the tabernacle in the desert. There were a lot of kind of similarities between their experience, their emotions, what was going on with them and what seemed to be going on with us uh, while uh, that project, that building project that we called it the never ending building project uh, took place over that period of time. And as I read the story in the book of Exodus about the building of the tabernacle, I noticed that there were many lessons that could be taken from this story about building things, making things for the Lord, whatever those might be. And so this morning I'd like to share several of these lessons with you because sooner or later the Lord eventually calls on his people to build something, or as in the case with us, to rebuild something. You may have heard various elders when they come up here to pray or to lead in worship, and when they're talking about our own congregation, they use the word rebuild. We don't need to build new, we're already built, but there's a lot of rebuilding going on and we know why, you know, uh, I think for the same reasons that other churches and other institutions uh, who have been decimated by uh, the ongoing uh, COVID uh, uh, pandemic and all of the things that go with that uh, pandemic, the, the loss of jobs and the disruption of, of our society. And so this morning, as I say, I want to share a couple of these lessons with you because the Lord is calling on us to rebuild our congregation. But first, let's get a little bit of background information on what's going on or what was going on as we read the passages for this lesson. We know uh, that uh, after the Jewish people were freed from slavery in Egypt, uh, that they lived in the desert for 40 years, four decades, imagine, living in, the, living in the desert. And while they were there, God provided food and water and protection for them every single day. Uh, we could do, do a whole lesson just on the way he provided food, the manna. You know, he didn't give them a week's worth of manna. He didn't give them like, you know, some for today and six months supply of manna that they could put in their manna bank. You know. He gave them manna just for one day, just one day's manna uh, worth of food uh, for each and every day. But he provided uh, for us, uh, for them rather. And he also gave them laws and customs as well as an organized religion and a way to worship him that was different than the pagans uh, around them. For their religious practices, he gave them instructions and the exact plans to build, there's that building thing again, to build a special tent 
or a tabernacle where the Jewish priests could offer prayers and sacrifices on behalf of, of the people. Now, this tabernacle was basically a rectangular shaped box about 150 feet long, and about 75 feet wide. It had an interior room about 15 by 45, which was itself divided into two smaller spaces, one called the holy place, where they kept a, a candlestick and a table with bread on it and an, alt, an altar uh, to offer a sacrifice, an incense rather. And uh, this was separated by a, a curtain uh, from a smaller space. Two spaces were separated by a curtain and the smaller space was called the Holy of Holies. And in this area uh, was the uh, Ark of the Covenant. Uh, the Ark of the Covenant was a, a smaller box that contained the tablets that had the Ten Commandments, uh, also a jar with manna and uh, Aaron's rod that had budded uh, miraculously to demonstrate that Aaron was the true, uh, uh, the true leader of the uh, people at a certain point. Now it was into this inner room that the high priest would come once a year only and offer a sacrifice uh, for the sins of the people. Now the tabernacle, as I told you, 100 by 75, had a frame of wood and was covered with materials that were spun with gold and animal skins. The wood was covered with silver and gold. It's as if we, we had our, you know, our uh, uh, our support beams here, all the support beams. Imagine that all of them were uh, uh, overlaid with, with pure gold. Imagine what this, uh, what this room would look like. Well, the tabernacle, everything was overlaid with, uh, with gold and, and, and silver. Uh, and the altar and the furnishings were also all covered with precious gold and stones and silver and, and uh, uh, you know, other precious materials. And so God gave the people the exact blueprint for the construction and also he qualified the kinds of materials that he wanted used in the, uh, in the tabernacle and for the various uh, instruments inside the tabernacle. And he also commanded that the people build this uh, one of a kind structure themselves. You know, they didn't want to bring in any specialists or anything, you're going to build it, he said and I'll teach you how to build it, I'll give you a plan. So the few passages that we're going to read uh, this morning briefly describe this particular story about the construction of the tabernacle. And again, just a few verses to get the idea of what was going on. The first is uh, uh, Exodus chapter 35. And it says there, then all the congregation of the sons of Israel departed from Moses' presence everyone whose heart stirred him and everyone whose spirit moved him came and brought the Lord's contribution for the work of the tent of meeting. That's what it was called, the tent of, the tent of meeting. And for all its service and for the uh, uh, holy garments. And so what's happening here is that Moses is telling the people, we're going to build this tabernacle and it's going to be beautiful and it's going to need all kinds of things and he, uh, uh, he uh, commands them to, to bring all the supplies. We're going to need this, we're going to need silver, we're going to need gold, we're going to need precious metals, uh, pr uh, precious uh, stones, uh, 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 golden thread, uh, skins, you know, all a supply list, a shopping list. And then it says, you know, then all the congregation of the sons of Israel departed from Moses. Well, they, they left and they went to collect these particular things. Then we read, you know, skip a few lines there, and we read in verse 30, it says, Then Moses said to the sons of Israel, See, the Lord has called by name Bezalel, the son of Uri, the son of Hur, the, of the tribe of Judah, and he has filled him with the Spirit of God in wisdom and in understanding and in knowledge and in all craftsmanship to make designs for working in gold, in silver, and in bronze and in the cutting of stones for settings, and in the carving of wood, so as to perform in every inventive work. The design of the tabernacle and the requirements of the tabernacle were so precise, so demanding, 
that God provided the workmen with uh, spiritual abilities to be able to accomplish these physical, these physical tasks. And then one more passage that kind of talks about this in 36, Exodus 36, it says, and all the skillful men who were performing all the work of the sanctuary came, each from the work which he was performing. And they said to Moses, the people are bringing much more than enough for the construction work which the Lord commanded us to perform. So Moses issued a command and a proclamation was circulated throughout the camp saying, let no man or woman any longer perform work for the contributions of the sanctuary. Thus the people were restrained from bringing any more for the material they had was sufficient and more than enough for all the work to perform it. Now, if you read all of the chapters in Exodus about this episode, you learn that the people contributed more than enough material and money needed and the workmen and the tradesmen finished the job exactly according to God's original plan. This was a kind of a high point in the life of the Israelites. They received the command from God that was very difficult. Uh, he, in, he inspired them and he, uh, he enabled them to do the work at a, at a very high level of performance. And then he called on the people to provide all of the resources for the work. And the people not only provided the resources, but they provided more than enough to the point where Moses had to give a command, stop, you're giving too much money. I know it's an old preacher's joke, but you know, I've never had to say that. I've never had to repeat that at any time from this pulpit, stop, the collection's too big. We have to give some of the money back. You don't know, <laughs> there was too much. And then it says, and they completed it exactly the way God had commanded it. I want to ask you something. When you're reviewing your life, when you're you know, examining how things are going and what you're doing and how you're performing and how, you're, you know, how your spiritual life is going, do you ever get the feeling, yeah, I'm doing it exactly as God wants me to. Have you, have you ever had that feeling? Yeah, God wants me to do this and I've done exactly what he's wanted me to do. I have performed as a Christian exactly how God wants me to perform. I don't know about you, but I've never been able to say that. In my life it's, well, I, I, I knew what it is that he wanted and I saw it in my mind's eye and I saw the goal out there and with all my heart, I, I really wanted to get there. But when the whole thing was added up at the end, well, I could have done better over here and I, I kind of lost it over there. And there were some good moments here and there, you know, but I didn't, I didn't do it exactly how he wanted me to do it. That's why this here is, like I say, a high point in the Israelites' life. They did it exactly the way he wanted it done. And so it's estimated that to build the same tabernacle today would cost hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars. So there's, there's no comparison with their project. And you know, for example, the one that we worked on in, in 1998, you know, 99, I think the final cost was a little over half a million dollars. You know, not the same as far as expenses and money are concerned, but there are some lessons here that we can all use today in our service to God now and in the future, and especially as we think about rebuilding, because you know, the church has been damaged by a lot of the things that have taken, uh, taken place. So many of our members have died. That's hurt the church. And so many have moved, their jobs stopped, so they went and worked somewhere else, therefore leaving our area, going somewhere else. Others have 
decided to try to worship with another group, for example, hoping perhaps uh, that might be a better experience for them. So there's, there's a couple of lessons here that hopefully can help us uh, when we uh, take seriously the idea of rebuilding this congregation. Lesson number one. Lesson number one is God wants everyone to participate in the building and in the rebuilding. In the Bible, we see that everyone brought something for the construction of the tabernacle. The, the poor brought thread for the curtains or their gold earrings. The only precious thing they had were their gold earrings and they removed them and you know, contributed those things. The rich, on the other hand, they gave money and they gave precious stones. Still others offered their services to sew curtains, to transport supplies. There's got to be something uh, that I can do, they said. And so the tabernacle was designed to serve the spiritual needs of everyone in the camp. So everyone in the camp had a duty to contribute in some way. Well, I remember that we saw this very same spirit during our own construction time as different people volunteered their time to clean up and to transport items around the building after the construction was over. See, some guys, they didn't know how to nail and they couldn't, you know, they couldn't do sheetrock work and they didn't know how to weld and they didn't know how to do roofing or anything like that, but they knew how to pick up junk off the floor and, and sweep up. And so I would see guys come after work, suit and tie and take that off and they'd brought their jeans and their old t-shirts and put their running shoes on. And after the workmen were here, the professional tradesmen left, they went about cleaning up. And every, every day when the, when the pros would show up on the job site, they showed up to a clean job site, all the lunch you know, paper and the junk and the hot dog buns that are left over on the floor, all that stuff was gone and clean and swept. They were ready for a new day because some people just wanted to do something, even if it was taking the trash out. Because they wanted to do their part, even if they weren't pros. The rebuilding process needs the same spirit of common ownership and commitment. It isn't the minister's plural job to do it. It's the congregation's job, including the ministers, to rebuild the Choctaw uh, congregation. We are rebuilding our congregation so that all of us can serve the Lord, our Lord. You know, Jesus died to save the soul of every member of this church. No one is more saved than another. No one is more blessed than another. No one will receive more heavenly rewards than another in the end. It's only fitting then that each person feel equally responsible when it comes to helping the church that Christ died to save. And so one of the building lessons is that God wants everyone to participate in some way. Lesson number two, God wants your best. Note that the people didn't bring their leftovers. They were asked to bring the very best of their materials, jewels, wood, whatever. I remember uh, uh, one of the members, uh, an older member, a senior saint, and uh, she came to my office and uh, she had a, a, a handkerchief, a lady's delicate handkerchief. And you know how you put stuff in it and then you take the handkerchief and then you tie it in a knot. And she said, well, I, I can't sew. She was all you know, arthritic. She says, I can't sew and I can't lift and I can't sweep and I am not a rich person, you know, but, I, but I want to help. And so she opened her bag up <laughs> And she reached inside and she pulled out this hanky. 
And I said, okay, you know, I'm getting ready here to try to be polite, you know, <laughs> with what's going to happen. And she unties the knot and she turns it upside down and there she pours out on my desk diamond rings, you know, jewelry, precious jewelry, her great grandmother's bracelet, gold bracelet, so on and so forth. And she said, here, she says, instead of having the kids fight over all this stuff, I want to give it. And I remember having the appraiser, it's just like in the movies, I had a, I had a jewelry appraiser come, you know, and the guy put his little eye thing there, you know, and he was checking it out and said, yeah, this is, that's a real diamond. And so, and I think we, there were about three or $4,000 worth of, of jewelry there. And remember that's, you know, 1998, three, four, five, thousand dollars That's all she could do, but she did it. God's tabernacle was to be made of the very best materials, the very best design, the very best workmanship, no junk. And the relationship between this and the story of the sister was there was no junk in her handkerchief. She didn't bring her costume jewelry. You know what I'm saying? She didn't bring that. She brought her good stuff, stuff that was worth something. Why would we ever think any differently today? It's the same God we worship. Of course, this church building is not the tabernacle, and it's not the tent or the house of the Lord. We're the house of the Lord. The Spirit of God lives inside of us. But why would we think that when we do something in God's name, whether it's a building a building or teaching a class or leading a prayer, that we shouldn't offer God our very best. You men who lead the prayer, is the prayer you're about to lead, do you feel it will be your very best? You know, there were so many priests and Levites in Israel that some priests and Levites never got a chance in an entire lifetime, they never got the chance to go and serve at the tabernacle. There were just too many of them. It was a lottery system. They'd pick your number and they'd say, okay, uh, Levite so-and-so or so-and-so priest, you, know, you get the opportunity to offer sacrifice or you get the opportunity to do this prayer you know, because there were so many of them. And when you had an opportunity to go do something like that, it was like a once in a lifetime thing. Here the same man may be called on a hundred times in several years to lead a prayer. But what if you were only called one time in your life to go before God to lead a prayer? Do you think maybe you'd put a little bit of thinking into it? Or baking the, the bread for the visitors? Is it your best recipe? God gave his best for us, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross to save us. We should always be ready to offer him our best when we serve him. No spiritual junk. No spiritual junk. Giving him our best builds up and rebuilds the church that God has has given us. Why wouldn't we want to give God our best? One project prepares us for the next. The Jews built the tabernacle well, and later they were given the task of building the magnificent temple in Jerusalem, many times more beautiful and complex than this first structure. God is always preparing us for the future. And it's not always for building things, of course. You know, going through a serious illness prepares us to cope with other challenges in the future. If there's anything that my uh, several years of illness have taught me is that I don't get as stressed out now 
over uh, small things that I used to get stressed out about. You know, leaving the house and forgetting that I left something back at the house and having to stop and turn around and go back. You know, five years ago, man, that would have stressed me out. You know, the, the blood pressure would have gone up and I, it would have been, yeah, you, you know, I'd be on me. You know, I'd be smacking myself. You know, how could you do that? How could you forget? Wake up, come on, let's go. You know, that, that was, uh, my coach would be talking to me. Not anymore, <laughs> not anymore, not anymore. Doing well with a small project at church prepares us to take on a more challenging ministry or project to make the church grow later on. Or dealing with family crisis helps us learn to deal with crisis and challenges in our career or at school, for example. You know, when you feel challenged and the road seems uphill, realize that usually God is preparing you for something greater, for something even more rewarding to come. When, when, when we're committed to faith in Christ and service to God, He prepares us one step at a time for greater service and responsibility in the kingdom of God. One thing that we need to learn as Christians is that increased responsibility is a reward from God, not a burden. One of the elders walks up to one of the brethren and say, hey, you know, we, there, there's an area in the church, it's, it's weak, it needs some help, it needs some leadership. You think you could take this on? You think you could, you know, uh, you know, ship, get this thing into ship shape and get some volunteers and you know, get her done. And, and, and sometimes the response is, oof, another weight on my shoulder, just what I needed, another job, another task, another responsibility. We don't see it as a reward. That's how God rewards us. More responsibility is a reward, not a burden. Anyways, the Jews finished what seemed a, an impossible project while they were in the desert, but they succeeded and they left many lessons to help us in our lives and in our service, in our families, in our churches. Hopefully in the things we have done recently, as well as things we want to do in the future, there are things in the future we want to do. Wouldn't we like to you know, renovate our existing buildings to accommodate more large classrooms, have more flexible and, and, and uh, visitor friendly uh, auditorium and foyer? Wouldn't that, wouldn't that be fun? How about forming a, uh, a, 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 a planning group uh, whose task is to plant a new congregation in the area or in another county where there, you know, where there are no uh, churches. How about that project? How'd you like to be part of that? I have a congregation that supports uh, Bible talk in South Carolina where uh, actually Julia and I are going to go uh, next month to speak and to visit with the elders there and all that business. And I really admire that church, the Gold Hill Road Church of Christ. I really admire that church. They have, they have planted two additional churches in the time that I've known about them. And I don't mean you know, send one guy out. Okay, you, you, you go plant a church over. No, 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 no. They put together a, a group, you know, a planning group, steering committee, whatever. The church buys the land. They do a survey to find out if that'd be a good place. They buy the land. Then they built the building. And then two of the existing elders, along with maybe 75 of their members, moved all the way over to start that church. What a start that is for a congregation. And they provide money and resources to make sure that they get off to a good start. And you know what's amazing about that? You'd think that taking two of their elders and 75 of their motivated members would put a hole in them that would destroy them. But the opposite has been the result. 
Doing that, that hole closed up immediately and the church grew back to its normal size within a year to the point where they repeated the process a second time. And wouldn't, wouldn't, that be, wouldn't that be wonderful if we could do that? And we can, we can do that. We also have opportunities that we are taking advantage of and planting churches and training men, but we're doing it for churches and people in Africa and in Haiti, and that's to be commended. I mean, we're doing a good job, but you know what? We could be doing the same thing here as well, not forgetting this work, but adding to this work other evangelistic work. Perhaps when we try to do th these things, we would remember that God will expect everyone to participate if we're going to succeed. And that God expects us to do our best, the best and most beautiful building possible. The most dynamic congregation will be the ones that we plant. And the missionaries we support, they'll be the most dynamic and productive missionaries that we can find. And thirdly, that God will use what we do, what we try in order to prepare us for whatever service he has for us in the future. I pray to God that he will use us in the future. One more thing to remember when we consider our service and our future as a church, lesson number four, God will always provide what we need. Does that get an amen? Yeah. Notice in Exodus that the workers came back to Moses in order to stop the people from giving because they had more than enough to do the job. God had made the people so generous that they gave beyond the needed hand. So when we're serving God's purpose and God's plan and God's people, then we can be assured that He will provide for the work. We don't always know where it'll come from or when. We don't always have all that we need to finish at the start, but God will always provide what we need to do His will. Our task is to make sure that we're doing His will and not our will, and that we actually start to build or serve in faith. When we take the first step by faith, God will always provide what we need to take the next step or to finish the job that he's given us to do. So I encourage all of us here to not be afraid to take the first step of faith in obeying and serving God. And be assured that if you do, he will reward you by being with you himself for every other step that you will take in serving him with your best. And so I finish with a question. Is this a first step day for you? Is it a first step to becoming a Christian by confessing Christ and repenting and being baptized? Is this your first day to do that? Or is it a first step in being reconciled to God after falling away by having the elders pray for you? Is this the first step day for that? Or is it the first step in getting your marriage back on track? Or is it the first step in renewing a friendship with an apology? Or maybe taking charge of your life by finally making a decision, a change, or a commitment? If so, ask the Lord to be with you and provide what you'll need for step number two and all these steps that will come afterwards. I guarantee you, he will never ever let you down. And so if your first step is to come to Christ this morning, then please step out from the pew that you're sitting in and come forward to confess your faith in Christ as we stand and as we sing our song of encouragement. Shall we do that now, please? <laughs> 